Live from KSAT 12, the 6 o'clock news starts right now. A month after a two-year-old girl was killed in a drive-by shooting, San Antonio police make back-to-back -back arrests in that case. Yesterday, they cuffed the suspected shooter, Darian Turner. And today, they walked Anthony Ares Mendez in front of our cameras. He's accused of organizing this drive-by, but he says SAPD got the wrong guy. I'm sorry that 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 happened and uh, you know, I mean, uh, I don't understand why, why I'm involved. On the afternoon of May 8th, police were called to a home in the 100 block of Future Drive that's on the north side for a shooting. That's where they found two year old Mackenzie Hernandez Garcia, who had been hit twice and was killed. Police tell us the intended target did live at the home that was shot at. They add that home is not a problem home, but did have a single incident days before the drive by. This all resulted from a assault that took place before the shooting. Um, because of an assault that took place, uh, Mr. Adiz Mendez organized the shooting to occur to target a specific individual. Police say both suspects in this case are currently facing capital murder charges and that this is an active investigation and more arrests are possible. The San Antonio police chief says it's been decades since he can recall a spike in gun violence like we're seeing right now. That was back in the late 80s and 90s when Chief William McManus was working in Washington, D.C. He said then that gangs and drugs caused that rise in shootings. But as R.J. Marquez reports, it's what's happening now in San Antonio that's left him baffled. At the scene of a murder-suicide this morning. The first car on the scene took about 40 rounds from the suspect. The suspect fired on officers for nearly 30 minutes along Raybon Drive before killing himself. SAPD says the man killed his roommate first. Today, it seems that at the slightest provocation, people are pulling guns on each other and not afraid to use them. I don't know what's causing that. There have been nearly a dozen shootings in San Antonio since last weekend. Chief McManus has repeatedly pointed to gun access. It seems that anyone who wants to carry a gun is carrying it. Starting in 2021, the state's constitutional carry law allowed people 21 and older to carry a handgun in public without a license. You have to be 18 to buy a rifle or shotgun and without a criminal record. And it's guns, McManus has said, that are being used to solve conflict. Right now, people are keeping it inside and they're walking around like ticking time bombs. Donna Costa is the director for a program called Bridges to Care. She says many people are still dealing with pressure following the pandemic. People have lost jobs and um, maybe they've gotten reemployed but are underemployed. For adults that who may be caregivers, that's a lot of weight to bear. A survey from the American Psychological Association showed that record high inflation was causing stress for 83% of American adults. 75% reported crime, mass shootings, and gun violence were a significant source of stress, with Latinos being the demographic most likely to be stressed by violence. Bridges to Care works with community groups to help people learn how to resolve issues without violence. Teach small skills on how to interrupt that alarm that we all have in our brain. And those who actually get to that place, pulling out a gun is like the extreme that the last resort. I've not seen anything like this. RJ Marquez, KSAT 12 News. And as San Antonio tries to tackle gun violence, one city councilman thinks there's another tool the city could try, a voluntary gun buyback. But Garrett Berger tells us this is not the first time he's floated this idea. The District 9 councilman, John Courage, the logic is simple. Any weapons that we can get out of the hands of people that could injure themselves or somebody else who commit a crime is of a benefit to the city. And to him, a gun buyback program could do that. He's still putting together specifics on funding and who would be involved, but he'd like to make it happen this fall. I'm trying to carry the ball, but I'm glad to see others get on board and carry that ball with me. Courage helped propose a similar idea after the El Paso Walmart mass shooting in 2019 but says he and council allies didn't feel they had the support to move it forward and ended up withdrawing it. But I think there's a lot more intention to support this than there was back then. One opponent at the time was police chief William McManus, who called buybacks ineffective. The folks who, who turn in those guns are not the ones using them on the street. Through a spokesman, the chief declined to comment before seeing exactly what's being proposed this time around. Courage says there's also gun thefts to consider, or accidents with kids, or suicides. And he points to other cities like Houston, where more than 2,800 guns were collected over three events. Another one scheduled for tomorrow. We're also seeing our violent crime numbers go down. 
in Houston right now. So the buybacks in Houston are just part of a larger plan to tackle crime. Every one of these is combined to reduce reduce the murder rate and reduce the violent crime. Courage sees success in simply removing the weapons. Because the weapons they've taken are destroyed and will not take another person's life or commit a crime. How else do you want to measure success? Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. Doyler News and a dog owner will likely face criminal charges after his bulldog sent a child to the hospital just after 1030 last night. San Antonio police responded to a dog attacking a nine year old being bit in the ankle. An adult was nipped by that same dog and checked out by doctors. The dog currently in the custody of animal care services. ACS says if the owner surrenders the dog, ACS will keep the dog, but it likely will not be rehomed. Generally speaking, if an animal has bite history, we don't feel safe putting that animal back out into the public. Therefore, the only choice that we have is to euthanize that pet. The owner of the dog in this case will likely face charges for the dog bite and possible fines for the pet not having a rabies vaccination. A former San Antonio police officer accused of shooting a teenager last year in a car outside of a McDonald's appeared in court this morning. As Erica Hernandez reports, prosecutors are continuing to build their case against that officer. State versus James Brennan with the lawyer's peace approach. A quick setting Friday morning for former San Antonio police officer James Brennan as attorneys conferred about where they stand on the case. Brennan was arrested last October after his body cam footage shows him shooting 17-year-old Eric Cantu multiple times while he was inside a vehicle in the parking lot of a Northside McDonald's. The case getting national attention as Cantu spent numerous weeks in the hospital with injuries to his stomach, diaphragm, lungs, liver, bicep, and forearm. Brennan was later indicted on two counts of aggravated assault by a public servant and one count of attempted murder. In court, prosecutor Daryl Harris updated 437 District Court Judge Joel Perez about some new evidence he was preparing for the defense. I've also been made aware of uh, some incidents involving the defendant. Uh, in his employment as an officer that could be probative to this matter. That information has been loaded to discovery, but I'm going to give them a paper copy to support their investigation. This was only the second court setting for this case, and a few more are expected before a trial date would be set. Next up, a pre-trial hearing on motions to suppress evidence is expected, but it has not been scheduled yet. In the meantime, Brennan remains out on bond. At the Kathina Reeves Justice Center, Erica Hernandez, KSAT 12 News. The voting rights advocates in Texas applauding this week's ruling by the U.S. Supreme Court on a case out of Alabama. Both states were sued, claiming the voting lines they had redrawn were discriminatory. The high court agreed Alabama had violated the Voting Rights Act and ordered the maps to be tossed out. Jesse DeGriado now with the possible impact the Alabama ruling may have on the Texas case. In its ruling, the U.S. Supreme Court is said to have firmly rejected Alabama's argument. If you're going to bring a voting rights case, you have to do it without respect to race. So now that's one argument the state of Texas can't use, says Nida Perales with the Mexican-American Legal Defense and Educational Fund. It's very helpful for us in the Texas case to have this pronouncement from the Supreme Court. The high court ordered Alabama to redraw its redistricting map with only one black majority district in a state where one in four voters are black. Does that in any way compare to what Texas did to Latino voters? We have very similar arguments in the Texas redistricting litigation. Maldives lawsuit says the maps redrawn in Texas are discriminatory by not reflecting an important fact. The Latino population has grown significantly in Texas over the last decade. Perales says that's especially true in Houston, Dallas-Fort Worth, and parts of South Texas. San Antonio, she says, didn't lose representation. But the leadership in the legislature manipulated the lines as we say in our lawsuit, to minimize uh, Latino voting strength. Filed in 2021, Maldives' lawsuit is awaiting a trial date. Jesse Degollado, KSAT 12 News. Tonight, we're getting a look at the booking photo of Nate Paul. He's an associate of Ken Paxton, who's at the center of the Texas State Attorney General's impeachment case. Paul was charged today with making false statements to mortgage lenders to obtain $172 million in loans. 
He was scheduled to make his first appearance in court today after he was arrested yesterday. Paul's faced numerous lawsuits from creditors and business partners over the years. Several of his companies filed for bankruptcy or have been placed under the supervision of court-appointed overseers. Take a look outside right now with live cam, and it is blue skies and warm temperatures. Yeah, feeling a little more like summer, Adam. Oh, it's feeling like summer, all right. Just got the updated almanac for the day, and I'll uh, share that with you in a bit. But I want to talk about that 10% chance we were talking about for today. Well, you're looking at it right here. Over the past couple of hours, we had a downpour with some lightning and thunder and even pea-sized hail in parts of Kerr County and around Kerrville. And now near Junction and creeping into western Gillespie County, a little bit of activity as well. You look at the areas that saw the rain, it's actually an area that really needs the rain. Ingram to Kerrville, even down to Center Point, over an inch estimated in parts of the west side of Kerrville between Kerrville and Ingram. We'll talk about another slight chance of storms before it's all about the heat and humidity in just a bit. All right, thanks, Adam. Let's take a look at traffic out there right now. 410 at Jackson Keller. You can see it's slow going coming towards the camera but we have no real big wrecks or construction zones to make you aware of. Looks like six o'clock on a Friday. Got an itch? Mosquito season is here and after all that rain, the bugs are bad. KSET's Avery Everett, our newest reporter, has reminders on what you can do to repel them after the break. Have you noticed them yet? The bugs are bad after all that rain we've had. Mosquitoes are leaving their mark wherever they can. But Avery Everett bared the bites to remind you what you can do to fend them off. On what seems like a perfect summer day. It's been horrible. Uh, we're both covered in bites right now. Mosquitoes are making themselves known. Having a toddler, you definitely have to have them outside. So, um, yeah. And tough. <laughs> Courtney and little Lucy Teal took a trip to Bracken Ridge Park today. It is very hot. <laughs> After days of rain, they finally felt the sun, but they also felt the mosquitoes. And Metro Health is reporting an uptick of the insect. And with all the rain that we've had, there's been a lot of stagnant water, which creates a breeding ground for mosquitoes. That health official says to stay safe, you should try and wear longer clothing, avoid perfumes outside, and spray repellent on your clothes, not your skin. Metro Health says people usually only assume that mosquitoes are near bodies of water, but they say you should also be prepared if you're near wet soil or a lot of leaves. And as long as we have rain, there's going to be mosquitoes. Even though today the rain has gone away, the Teal family isn't letting it take their spirits too. We've been to the botanical gardens. They were really bad there too, but I mean, it's so beautiful and the flowers are great. So it's kind of like you got you to gotta pick your battles. Mosquitoes may be out. We're doing our best. But so will Courtney and Lucy hoping to make the most of every summer day. Avery Everett, KSAT 12 News. And a big welcome to Avery Everett. Absolutely. Reporter. Yeah, welcome yeah. to the KSAT team. And, mm -hmm. you know, I'm glad we got a story that bugged her <laughs> to start. Got her on the yeah. bites to begin with. You're yeah. the new reporter. Let's send you out to <laughs> how about mosquito bites. <laughs> ah, she did great with it. Yeah, she did a great job. Yeah, because they're bugging everybody. That's for sure. After all that rain, Adam. Avery Everett rolls right off the tongue. I love yeah. it. And yes, Good those name. mosquitoes are and the flies. Have you noticed the flies? Oh, yeah. Yes. Inside the house, outside the house, everywhere. But, you know, that's a, it's the time of year for that. It's also a consequence. Whenever we get a lot of rain, those insects just love to come out. Ones that you've think you've never seen before too. I've noticed that. All right, look, we can't rule out a few more storms, not just today, but even into tomorrow. Triple digit heat, it's on the way. And then not only hot, but also humid. We've got the triple digits with high humidity. We're gonna get into that in a moment. All right, let's take a look at the radar screen and you'll see that over the past couple of hours, we had those downpours with a little bit of lightning and thunder and even pea sized hail just west of Kerrville and Kerrville got clipped as well by the rain. Now all we have left over is up in Junction, some new development there along I-10 and even up closer to uh, western Gillespie County. But locally, Nothing to talk about. I do want to point out this thunderstorm that popped up and was very brief east of San Marcos. It did push an outflow boundary. You'll see it here, this green line, an outflow boundary westward. We'll watch that to see if that could develop something new, say closer to Canyon Lake or even Blanco and Johnson City in the uh, well, next 
30 to 60 minutes. That's what we're watching. Otherwise, it's pretty quiet. We just have that one storm we were talking about. Not even a very tall storm just has some lightning and thunder in it closer to junction. Here's the big picture and we're still going to be watching for some activity in West Texas. It's starting to come together here near Alpine and Marathon. It's starting to come together and we're going to watch for more organization as if it does organize, we could get the leftovers of some of that late tonight and into the early morning hours. We do have this bump in the upper level flow, this little ridge, but some energy coming in from the west that's moving into it. That's going to help kickstart some of that action in West Texas this evening and then also North Texas tomorrow. And then the steering wind could bring some of the leftovers and remnants our way. So that's what we're watching now. It's low end chances, but say something develops tomorrow afternoon or evening, then there's the likelihood it would become strong to severe, especially in East Texas. But even in our neck of the woods north of Highway 90, we have that severe weather risk. Again, it's a low end chance of a storm. But if we get that storm in the rare event, a storm develops a high end chance it would become strong to severe. When I say low on chance, we're looking at 10%, but that 10% we we're talking about for today, that was that storm over Kerrville. Just 10% of our area and even junction now getting clipped by one. So highly isolated if it happens and then 0% Sunday through next week. There's the big blue H. We've been tracking it this week. It's still over Western Mexico and parts of the Pacific, but it's moving into town and it's going to make it here and that's going to dominate our pattern in the days ahead. Press down on us and warm us up. Look at the update. 98. That's our high temperature today. It's the hottest we've been so far this year. The average high being 92. We're going to be above average for a while here. 96 currently, but here's the key. A dew point of 70. So afternoon dew points are high because of the moisture content in our soil. The first say 10 centimeters or so of of soil has all that moisture in it and that that translates into humidity even in the afternoon. And so we're going to have these high heat indices or feels like temperatures feels like 103 now, but it's going to be more than that this weekend. Dewey's in the low 70s. Usually this time of day we see the dew points drop off. That's not the case because of recent rainfall. Air temperatures right now right around the 100 degree mark out west and in the mid 90s locally. 74 in the morning tomorrow, 97 in the afternoon. There's that 10% chance. And then we get into the afternoon hours tomorrow again along the Rio Grande will be right about 100 degrees. But we do warm up a little bit more Sunday. I do think we'll be right near 100 locally, but feeling like it's as warm as 107. And then next week, Oh, about 100 degrees every single day. There it is. <laughs> we welcome. Knew it, we, we knew it was coming. All right. Thanks, Ooh, Adam. <laughs> not welcome. Yeah, thank you, Adam. All right, so he is a bobcat now, but that doesn't mean he still doesn't come to San Antonio maybe to recruit, see some old friends. Yeah, so G.J. Kinney, Texas State head football coach, he was in town last night out at the Chicken and Pickle, and he says he really needs to do these type of events because he wants to meet and greet people. Plus, yes, he really wants to recruit the 210. Plus, the Dallas Cowboys wrapped up mini camp, and they did it. Alan Strong, coming up. It's huge. Uh, it's exciting. It's just right down the road, and we're going to recruit uh, San Antonio like our hair's on fire and, and try to get the best of the best every year. So uh, you got to do stuff like this to get out and about and meet as many people as you can. Texas State head football coach G.J. Kinney was in town to hang out with Bobcat alumni at Chicken and Pickle and Big Board Sports. Pro football coverage powered by Davis Law Firm. The Dallas Cowboys know life is bigger than football, and that's why they wore Allen Strong t-shirts yesterday during the final practice this month. The Allen community suffered tragedy at the hands of an active shooter in a mall last month. Coach McCarthy bought the shirts and passed them out to his entire roster and members of the coaching staff. Now, as for football, Cowboys offseason pickup and wideout Brandon Cooks is turning heads this offseason as he looks to add another dimension to the boys' offense thanks in large part to his speed. Cooks is wide receiver number two behind C.D. Lamb. Dak Prescott was asked how fast is Cooks. Mm, you saw it. Uh, it's great. It's beautiful. Um, yeah, it, real, real speed runs runs the same way every time. I think that's the most important thing is when you have speed like that, for him to be able to do that every play, every route, um, the start of every route. Uh, yeah, the cornerbacks, defense, they don't know what they're getting because he makes it all look, all look the same. And yeah, as I've said before, he's thankful he's here. 
Cowboys wrapped up a three day mandatory mini camp at the star, which are the final scheduled sessions until training camp in Oxnard, California. Camp dates haven't been announced, but it is expected to be during the week of July 24th through the 28th. Texas State head football coach G.J. Kenny spent a couple of hours at Chicken and Pickle last night to meet and greet with Bobcat alumni and fans across the state of Texas as part of Coach's Nights with G.J. Kenny. Coming off his first spring as the Bobcats head football coach, he also has stops planned in Dallas, Houston, and Austin. KSAT 12's RJ Marquez has more. All right, we're out here at Chicken and Pickle on the northwest side, hanging out with new Texas State head coach, G.J. Kinney. Coach, what's it like for you to be back in San Antonio with the roots that you built here with UIW? Yeah, it feels great. Um, great event like this at, at Chicken and Pickle and the Texas State Alumni Association for hosting this. Uh, just be great to, to meet a lot of these uh, alumni and, and, and fans and, and uh, you know spread the knowledge of the new Texas State Bobcats. Yeah, Coach, it feels like there's a lot of excitement right now uh, building around the program. What has that been like for you? as uh, coming into your first season as Bobcats head coach? Yeah, a lot of work. Uh, guys came in here and, and uh, you know, building the relationships with the current players and then getting on the road recruiting and uh, the high school, JUCO, and the portal, uh, doing a little bit of everything. So definitely gained some weight with all the official visits. <laughs> Absolutely. Now, Coach, uh, there's part of that excitement is some of the recruiting. You guys have really, really hit the road and brought in a really, really impressive class. What's that been like for you guys and the staff just to be able to go out and meet all these coaches and be able to talk to all these players. Yeah, it's, it's been great getting back in the Texas high schools and building those relationships and, and rekindling some of the relationships. And, and uh, you know, my dad's a former Texas high school coach himself. So between him and myself and the rest of the guys on staff, um, it, it's been been great uh, to just get back in there and, and talk to those guys and, and recruit their players because, you know, that's going to be the, the lifeline of, of our program is Texas high school. Thank you, RJ, and thank you to Coach Kenny. Mm-hmm. RJ, RJ, Texas State alum. Oh, he is. He uh, loved yeah. it. Yeah, that was yeah, a tough assignment. To he was going to be out there anyway, probably. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Larry. Thanks, Larry. The prime suspect in Natalie Holloway's 2005 disappearance finally in the United States facing charges. We're going to talk about the case and how her family has waited more than a decade to find out what happened to their loved one. Joran Vandersloot in a U.S. federal court this morning, a long-awaited arraignment on charges related to the family of Natalie Holloway, who disappeared in 2005 during a high school graduation trip to Aruba. Vandersloot is one of the last people to see Natalie alive and a prime suspect in her disappearance, but he's still never been charged in that case and maintains his innocence. He arrived to an Alabama federal courthouse with a not guilty plea entered on his behalf by a federal judge for extortion and wire fraud charges. Vandersloot is accused of being involved in a plot to sell information on where Natalie's body could be found. A 2010 indictment filing shows the mother, Beth Holloway, delivered $25,000 to Vandersloot after he said that he would reveal where her daughter Natalie's remains were buried. I want him to tell the truth. He knows exactly what happened. He knows what, where, when, who, why, and how. Vandersloot is in Alabama on temporary extradition from Peru, where he's been serving time on unrelated crimes. And having pleaded not guilty, he will now stay in U.S. federal custody until the end of his trial. The Pentagon says it's sending more than $2 billion worth of air defense systems to and ammunition to Ukraine. In a recent statement by the Pentagon, they say the funding package part of the Ukraine Security Assistance Initiative. It's meant to help deter Russian aggression in the long term. The package will include Hawk air defense systems and missiles, as well as laser-guided rocket system munitions. The U.S. has committed more than $40.4 billion to help the Ukraine since the start of the invasion. Accept new refugees or pay up. That's the message from the European Union to its countries. The change to the EU's asylum and migration laws was designed to lessen the burden on countries receiving large numbers of refugees. Countries that don't want to accept refugees beyond a certain threshold will be charged. It's a $21,000 fine per refused refugee. The EU says that money will go towards supporting refugees in other European Union countries. Next weekend, President Biden will attend his first political rally since launching his re-election bid. Biden will travel to Philadelphia on June 17th, returning to a key battleground state that helped him win in 2020. The event organized by union members, but details not immediately available on which labor groups. 
will actually be involved in this rally. Former President Donald Trump now indicted on multiple counts in relation to the classified documents probe. He faces multiple charges, including one under the Espionage Act. Trump is expected to face a federal judge next Tuesday in Miami. CNN's Ivan Rodriguez reports from Florida with a breakdown of the charges and what led to this. It's the first time a former president has faced federal charges. Former President Trump indicted on multiple counts in connection with his mishandling of classified documents. Trump taking to true social Thursday night, calling it a dark day for America. They were a nation in decline. Trump admitted on tape in 2021 to have secret documents that he hasn't declassified, according to the unsealed indictment. But it's something he now denies. I'm an innocent man. I did nothing wrong. I'm innocent and we will prove that very, very soundly and hopefully very quickly. Last August, federal agents searched his Palm Beach, Florida home, Mar-a-Lago, where they found more than 100 classified documents, some labeled top secret. All this leading up to the charges he now faces, including one under the Espionage Act, obstruction of justice, destroying or falsifying records, conspiracy, and false statements. With the likely front runner of the Republican presidential nomination now indicted on federal charges, the probe triggering reaction from both sides of the aisle. I had hoped the Department of Justice would see its way clear to resolve these issues with the former president without moving forward with charges. And I'm deeply troubled to see this indictment move forward. This set of indictments is going to be an extraordinary bombshell, not just in the charges, but also in the facts and allegations that it reveals. In Miami, I'm Ivan Rodriguez reporting. It clues to solving the mysterious cases of long COVID may be found in our sewer systems. Scientists have been using wastewater samples to track community spread of the virus. During the genetic study of those samples, they found dozens of unique strains of the coronavirus with never before seen mutations. The source for these mutations may be people who've been living with long COVID for years, and some researchers are saying those infected people are shedding a thousand times more virus than the average patient. Doctors believe that virus could be causing long-term damage to those infected, and they may not even know it. The Netflix crackdown on password sharing is actually boosting new subscribers. The streaming analytics company Antenna reports this is the biggest increase in signups since the start of the pandemic. They say Netflix added about 100,000 new accounts on both May 26th and 27th, and a couple of days after that crackdown started. Netflix still plans to block unauthorized passwords soon, but it's offering a paid sharing option. For an additional $8 a month, users can become extra members on existing accounts. Bud Light's Pride River Parade getting ready to kick off. We're going to see what they have planned when we return. And students at a local elementary school learning how to plant and help grow fruit trees in an effort to develop an appreciation for the environment. We talk about some of the local programs where volunteers are educating the kids. 